Hello, my dear colleagues. Welcome to another webinar hosted by the Sri Lanka Dental Association and the Commonwealth Dental Association. Uh, I would like to every, uh, welcome everybody from all over the world uh, to this very important webinar. And uh, we have uh, with us a very important speaker uh, whom we got uh, with the support uh, from uh, Professor D.Y.D. Samarvikram as well. And uh, I would be uh, giving a very brief CV of uh, Professor Simo because all his allocates and uh, titles are too long for me to read <laughs> at this junction. <laughs> so I'll be very brief. Um, uh, professor Kevin Simo um, is a professor of uh, periodontology and an honorary consultant in restorative dentistry at the University of Manchester, United Kingdom. Uh, he is also the deputy head, division of dentistry, program director of MSc uh, clinical uh, periodont in periodontology, and the program lead for the BSc in oral health sciences, that is hygiene and therapy. He qualified from King's College London in 1981, and he got his PhD uh, in 1991 from the London Hospital Medical College. And he moved to uh, Manchester in 2012, and where he is residing right now. And he has co-authored two books. One is the Oxford uh, Handbook on Dental Nursing. And uh, the second one is Clinical Problem Solving in Periodontology and Implantology, which I might add, which is uh, kind of a textbook for a lot of uh, postgraduate uh, dental students uh, from all over the world be it periodontology or in restorative dentistry. And uh, he's a much sought after lecturer, uh, both locally and internationally. In fact, he has been gracious enough to accept the invitation from uh, Sri Lanka Dental Association to be a speaker at the forthcoming uh, uh, Asia Pacific Dental Conference, which will be held in this year uh, in Colombo uh, on May, uh, yeah, around May. And uh, uh, he has uh, published extensively in uh, international journals as well. So I think I have done justice uh, to the brief introduction. So without taking too much of time, I would like to invite uh, Professor Kevin Simo uh, to the podium uh, to give this uh, very fine and very, very updated uh, uh, speech on uh, Perio, what's new. Over to you, Kevin. Thanks very much and good afternoon. Well, sorry, good evening, everybody. Good afternoon to those of us in the UK, but good evening to you in um, Sri Lanka and other parts of the world. And it's great to see so many names that I recognise on the um, participants list. And I'm just sad that I wasn't able to make it to um, Colombo last year for APDC and also we'll be doing it virtually this year. But anyway, it's so nice to see so many familiar names um, and not faces, obviously, on this. But yeah. Um, and thank you very much for those warm well words and we words of welcome. And yes, I spent a long time at the Royal London and, and, and DYD did insist I wore a tie today. Now, those of you that were ever at the London, this is an old Royal London Hospital tie, which has stood me in great stead for many years. And what, what, what Sir Imavan didn't say was that when I was at the Royal London, I worked with and for DYD for a number of years. And of course, he was my PhD supervisor. And um, we didn't actually fall out in those three years, did we, uh, Sam? Um, but um, yeah, we worked very closely together and have remained good friends ever since. So my friend and mentor, Sam, thank you very much. So I will talk, um, I will share my screen and um, start this lecture. It's very much a personal view and it may not be what you're expecting or it may be less than you're expecting, but it's a personal view on you know, my own thoughts, particularly of what's gone on really in the last 10 years or so actually since I moved from Queen Mary the Royal London up to Manchester um, where I sort of wondered that we were going I was going to a different part of the country and I kind of wondered whether the patients in Manchester were any different from the patients in London the answer no um, it's pretty much the same old same old you know periodontal disease is still caused by plaque although actually up north if anybody um, 
in, in the audience has been up north to Manchester in, in the UK. They don't refer to plaque as plaque, they refer to it as plaque in their northern accent. So maybe it's a different disease, I don't know. But are our patients any different from other patients in the UK or the world? We could talk a bit about risk factors, a little bit about the new classification. And of course, what is very, very topical at the moment, obviously with the pandemic, is there anything new as a result of COVID? Might ask some questions about that later. Periodontal disease, there's still a lot of it about. Okay, with the sort of um, conclusion that it's responsible for around three and a half million years lived with disability. Lots and lots of money lost and wasted in productivity and um, in terms of the huge um, American budget in terms of oral diseases. Okay, one of the most common diseases of mankind, it's the sixth most common dis prevalent disease worldwide with, a with an overall prevalence of 11%, which is quite a lot, 743 million people affected. And that's a lot. And the global burden is increasing sort of year on year. So we need to be very much aware of it. And of course, as periodontitis is the major cause of tooth loss in the adult population, um, you know, that means that there are people living with considerable um, disability, if only oral disability. But there's all the quality of life um, uh, measures and things that, 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 that we're aware of, you know, that people will suffer from as they lose their teeth, etc. But as I said, periodontal disease is still caused by plaque or biofilm, as we probably call it now. Um, it's still caused by plaque. And as a consequence, we still need to treat it as such. You know, we need to remove plaque. We need to remove plaque retentive factors, and we need to give the patient good oral hygiene instruction, etc. So the mainstay of our treatment is still non-surgical periodontal therapy. And I make no apology for that whatsoever. If you were um, tuning in and expecting me to show you lots and lots of slides of my fantastic surgery or my trainee's fantastic surgery these days, rather than mine, um, you won't be getting that. Um, I do always stress to my postgraduates and my trainees that periodontal disease or peri sorry, periodontology is a medical discipline, not a surgical discipline. And yes, we do like doing surgery. I find nothing more interesting and, and fun than spending an afternoon doing some perio surgery. However, it's a medical discipline and should be treated as such. So I think we just need to review the aims of non-surgical periodontal therapy, removal of attached bar films and non-attached microflora in the gingival sulcus, and the pocket should be removed. And remember that um, the Axelson um, aims of, of non-surgical therapy is that it's a very conservative process, so that we need to make sure that we conserve as much of the natural healthy tissue as possible, and that in particular means cementum to leave as much cementum on the root surface as we can with our debridement, because we know that cementum has the potential for repair. We know that within that periodontal environment are all the stem cells that we need to help regenerate that, the periodontium. We've got the, 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 the cells that can form cementum, ligament, and bone. So all the things that we need are all there within the periodontal wound environment, post non-surgical therapy, and post-surgical therapy. So our aims now are very much to be as conservative as possible. And it's important that we maintain this, um, almost this root, this root, um, this root, not sterility, but we maintain this um, clean root surface for as long as possible to prevent recolonization, etc. Okay, so is there any change in there? I think not really. I think we have more, certainly with my, um, uh, trainees and postgraduates, we have a lot more faith in our non-surgical therapy. And we also are able to look back on many, many years of studies uh, in the literature and also with our own patient audits um, to know how effective our non-surgical therapy can be. And so we still recognize it as the gold standard. And we are increasingly aware that repeated courses of non-surgical therapy will, if not cure the patient of disease, but it will limit the, um, the amount of disease the patient has or the burden of disease the patient has. And so that we may end up with a much more targeted area for our surgery, more of which I'll talk about later. WMD, uh, not weapons of mass destruction, but whole mouth disinfection. I'll come on to that a little bit more in, 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 in a bit, um, but whole mouth disinfection. 
do we do that? I mean, when I was training, we did um, a quadrant this week, a quadrant next week, a quadrant the week after, and a quadrant the week after that. Nowadays, we, we tend much more to do either the whole mouth or certainly half mouth at a day or two day intervals. Is there any great evidence that that's more effective? Probably not. And do we do the full whole mouth protocol that involves the use of chlorhexidine, um, scrubbing, uh, tongue brushing, uh, gargling, uh, irrigation of pockets with chlorhexidine? Probably not. The evidence for that was not that strong. But as I say, we are much more, um, well, much more frequently we retreat so that our debridement becomes more targeted as the sites decrease. We're much more able to um, uh, instrument fine infrabony defects. We have micro graces and mini graces. The micro graces, really fine curettes to get right to the base of the pocket, right in those very small narrow infrabony defects that we weren't normally able to get to with our conventional graces and curettes. So again, I say more faith in um, non-surgical therapy. Antimicrobials, I'll talk about antimicrobials in a moment. Should we be using them more or should we be using them less? It's always a debate. And if we're gonna use them, what antimicrobials should we use? Again, source of much debate amongst periodontists. If you ask a periodontist what antibiotics he should be using or what antibiotics he would use, or antimicrobials, if you ask three periodontists, you'd probably get four different answers, five different antimicrobials and six different dosages. So the, but, but there is evidence for all of those six, five and four protocols um, if you look in the literature. So, you know, it's almost, you know, pay your money, take your choice. COVID-19, what's that doing to us? Are there any links between COVID-19 and periodontitis? Have any been established yet? Would it change the disease or would it change our treatments? And I think it's worth us spending a few moments at some stage just considering that and how it might change things going forward. Certainly there is evidence that there's a possible viral etiology at some stages and some viral strains within the periodontal environment. And a number of mechanisms have been suggested. And certainly there are links between periodontitis and other chronic inflammatory diseases, some of which have a viral origin. However, the actual sampling of viruses from the oral environment is very, 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 um, primitive and quite often doesn't yield appropriately accurate results. But I think um, personally that there must be, I, one of my postgrads did a terrific review about three years ago on the possible etiology of virus or the link between viruses and periodontitis. Really, really nice. So there probably is some link somewhere, but as yet to be established. What about our treatment? I mean, certainly up until this time last year, I'd never heard of an aerosol generating procedure. And I'd never really thought about what that aerosol was doing in my, you know, while I was doing surgery or non-surgical therapy. And certainly in our clinics, you know, we are now much more aware of what is an AGP, what isn't an AGP. And we're able to do quite a lot of our treatment as non-AGPs, i.e. with a lot less risk for patient and operator. But that means we're not using ultrasonic scalars, satellites, we're not using hand pieces at the moment, although we are going to be able to use um, slow conventional hand pieces for bone um, removal because that generates splatter rather than aerosol. But it's meant that we've seriously rethought about our treatment protocols on an individual basis for that individual treatment session and also on the patient. You know, if we've got, if we're getting patients that are turning up for us in Manchester and some aren't, some because of our lockdown in the UK at the moment, some patients do not want to travel. They do not want to come to the dentist. They do not, don't want to come for what they consider to be elective treatment that is not of, 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 of an emergency nature. So in terms of periodontal disease, we really have to get back and motivate those patients. So are we gonna see more emphasis on the whole mouth, half mouth approach rather than quadrant approach? Yes, I think we are. But also um, my postgraduates at the moment are swearing at me because they're using hand instruments a lot more so that we can do our debridement as a non-AGP. Obviously, those of us of a certain age in the room, and I don't suppose there are many of my age, um, I can see a couple, um, we were brought up using hand instruments and we weren't really allowed to use the ultrasonic until we were, you know, we were grown up. So of course, you know, we're a bit more adept with our hand instruments. Our younger colleagues are becoming more adept. And I think we need to think about that as well going forward. So it's a time to refocus 
on our treatment approaches. Our patients are going to come in for, um, you know, cosmetic type surgery. I certainly know one of my colleagues who has a very nice private practice um, uh, doing implants and perio and very nice restorative um, cosmetic work. That practice has stopped most of their cosmetic work and are concentrating back on the basics. And I think that's going to be true for general practice going forward as well, that we are going to be concentrating much more on the basics. So that some of the stuff that we've learned over the past 10, 15 years in terms of the nice elaborate treatment plans we're doing, we may have to cut back and just be concentrating on getting patients out of pain, um, you know, dressing their caries, um, treating their caries, extracting teeth, making dentures and treating their periodontitis to preserve teeth. And that's my personal view over, over COVID. Um, if anybody's got any questions on that, I'd be very happy to, um, I'd be very happy to answer at the moment, but oops, sorry, I've just pressed the wrong button. Let's go back. So I'll just come on to antimicrobials, should we, shouldn't we? Um, there is a, if you talk to periodontists in Europe, and by Europe, I mean, when we were in Europe, I mean the United Kingdom and the European continent. The Central Europeans from Germany, Holland and so forth use a lot more antimicrobials in the treatment of chronic periodontitis than say we do in the UK. And they would encourage us, UK periodontists, to prescribe antimicrobials more. But of course the UK government have always moved uh, that we pr prescribe antimicrobials too much so that we should be encouraged to use them less. And so where do we stand in terms of antimicrobials? Well, as an adjunct, obviously, in certain cases. Now, the Europeans would suggest that we might use them in the treatment of chronic periodontitis, as was. I would suggest that we probably use them in treatment of what we used to refer in the 1999 um, classification, more coming on that in a moment, um, in terms of what we would call the aggressive diseases, such as the old fashioned localized juvenile, rapidly progressive generalized juvenile. There was a a slightly different altered host response, possible bacterial specificity, etc. So I'm, I might, I'm much more tempted to use in those cases in the early onset diseases. The evidence is that they are effective on a patient basis, but not very often on a whole population basis. And um, we've all probably got anecdotal evidence of, 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 um, of patients, individual patients that we've treated with antimicrobials as an adjunct who've been very successful. Herrera's classic review 2002, they use amoxil and metronidazole, effective in deeper sites. Um, as I said, there's evidence for most antimicrobials. Most periodontists have their favorite. Um, we used to use um, doxycycline, 200 milligrams once a day for three weeks, but patient compliance on that isn't great. Now we use amoxil and metronidazole over five days, seven days, um, variety of dosages, depending on which paper you read. Um, there's some very, um, there's some small studies using azithromycin, which is only a three day course of, of, of antimicrobials, which probably has much better patient compliance, very effective as well. Um, I think, um, but we must always remember that we use it as an adjunct to our normal conventional therapy. We don't specificity test, therefore the antimicrobials we use is pretty much a blanket response. Smokers, if we use in smokers, they are effective in smokers, but used for longer. Obviously for more specific sort of spreading infections, yes, abscess, necrotizing diseases, yes, we would use a specific antimicrobial targeted at those specific bugs. And the older fashioned aggressive periodontitis, as I said before. But the evidence for the use suggests that you should give your antimicrobial on the day of debridement completion so that the biofilm is removed from all teeth and that the course should be completed, um, or sorry, the debridement should be completed over a relatively short period of time. So we're talking about whole and half mouths. And Herrera also suggests that if we use antimicrobials, we should use the antimicrobials for their maximum benefit in the first course of non-surgical therapy. That's his suggestion in his review. Now, I sort of veer off that a little bit in that most of our patients, if we're going to give antimicrobials, we tend to give them in the second course of non-surgical therapy mainly because most of our patients come in and that their first course of non-surgical therapy, we are managing a lot of their disease and their plaque. And so that it's the second course of non-surgical therapy that almost becomes the sort of the more therapeutic in my head. Now, I don't know whether I'm probably veering a long way from the literature there, but that's the way I treat on the second course of non-surgical. 
Okay. But then, of course, we talk about aggressive periodontal disease. So we will probably talk about stage four, grade C, uh, in a patient with, with possible molar incisor distribution who's young. And then we might think about using antimicrobials then, because this is the, the periodontal disease that, that, that is the old fashioned aggressive, if you like. So doxycycline uh, still has a place, even though probably amoxylometronidazole is the, um, is the um, or are the antimicrobials of choice now. Um, but doxycycline still has a place, particularly in the younger patient with localized molar incisor pattern, providing they've got all their teeth have mineralized so you don't get staining. Okay, and as I said before, the disease is still caused by plaque. We do have patients that have a particular susceptibility to plaque. Here's a patient with HIV. That's periodontitis and it's caused by periodontal pathogens. It's just an exacerbated response because of the patient's altered immune response. But we see a fair bit of that around, particularly in our inner cities in the UK. We see a lot of patients with calcium channel blocker related um, gingival hyperplasia and cyclosporin related and epineutin related. We see more of those, particularly the calcium channel blocker related because more and more patients, uh, certainly in the UK are being medicated for their um, hypertension. And so calcium channel blocker is one of the, um, usually the cocktail of three that the GP prescribes. And quite often, if we want to get rid of the calcium channel blocker related um, hyperplasia, we quite often speak to the doctor and ask the doctor if they change the medication to one that's not calcium channel blocker. I'm mar married to a GP, she's upstairs at the moment, so I can't have this discussion. Um, but we often discuss about, you know, what's the, the relative importance of the calcium channel blocker in terms of me and my gums, as opposed to her and her patients with hypertension. Um, we've not resolved our differences over that, but we, can, we still discuss them, so calcium channel blocker. And of course, the other things that we're much more aware of now, and when I said about periodontal disease or per periodontology being um, a medical discipline, we're much more aware of risk factors that are related to the occurrence of disease, but not cause and effect but that modify the pathogenic processes and increase the probability of disease acquisition of which we are quite um, familiar. And I think we really became familiar with this about in the early 1960s. As I say, do the risk factors explain the variation in disease level that we see? You know, we plot a normal distribution curve of people with disease. And I think the classic work on that was Harold Lur's work on the tea plantations, on the tea workers um, in Sri Lanka, um, going back to the 60s uh, and kind of updated um, later on by Klaus Lang. Absolute seminal work um, where he based his um, studies on um, interpossible loss of attachment. He identified three sub subpopulations within his population, 8% with what he called rapid progression of disease, 81% with moderate and 11% with absolutely no progression of periodontal disease beyond gingivitis. And that began our sort of thinking about people being on that normal distribution curve. So that on one hand, on the right hand side, you've got young patients with lots of disease, losing all their teeth. And at the other side, you've got patients or people, not patients because they hadn't, didn't have any dental treatment, um, with no disease and no tooth loss. And the vast bulk of us in the middle with a moderate degree of attachment loss commensurate with the amount of plaque we had in our mouths etc which means there are some people at that left hand side that we don't need to bother with really because they're not going to get disease and then there's those at the right hand side that have a lot of disease and very often not a whole huge amount we can do about that and that was when we started to think that people were on this spectrum of disease and their response and their and incidence of disease could be related not just to their plaque but to a variety of other things. And this is just the, con the conclusion from, from uh, Harold Lur in 19 1986. I was privileged to meet um, Professor Lur in Colombo in, golly, APDC, but I can't remember the date. I sat next to him at the reception, excuse me, I sat next to him at the reception. I was very, very honored to meet him. And actually, as I walked into the reception next to him, we were we, we were filmed for um, the TV news that evening. So I not only did I meet Harold Lowe, I appeared on television with him, obviously only as a <laughs> only as a prop. But there we go. Um, so yeah, so that's his conclusions. And we're, we're aware of a number of risk factors, aren't we? Systemic risk factors such as genetic, environmental, behavioral, lifestyle, metabolic, hematological. So we just talk about a few of those. Smoking, massive, massively significant risk factor for periodontitis massively significant. 
which we've been aware of for a number of years. It is dose related. So the more you smoke, the more risk you are. And obviously when you cut down your smoking, your risk decreases. Obviously like a bit like heart disease, it takes, a, it takes a while for that lag phase. And also you may have lost a lot of attachment during your smoking period so that in the future you will still be um, suffering from that level of disease that you had back then. So smoking, very important. The other ones, key ones now, diabetes types one and two significantly enhance um, people's susceptibility to periodontal disease. Um, again, diabetes has a strong genetic basis, but it's probably not that that gives you your um, uh, increased disposition to perio. More likely to be the state of um, localized hyperglycemia, which will in fact alter your neutrophil function, connective tissue, and other metabolism, so that you know you're, you are much more locally susceptible to disease, particularly the altered neutrophil function. And if we go back in time to the sort of late 70s, early 80s, when there was a lot of work done on the, again, what we called in 1999, the aggressive diseases or the early onset diseases, most of those, particularly the work from Van Dyck and people, most of the, most of the literature then identified um, neutrophil deficiencies or defects in behavior as being key diagnostic features of things such as LJP, GJP, rapidly progressive, periodontitis, et cetera. So yeah, so, so, so a very real thing and maybe not just it's genetic, you know, may just not be that, it may be the local hyperglycemia. Okay, obviously smoking, if you look um, uh, in epidemiological studies, more sites with deeper pockets, greater levels of attachment loss in smokers, morphication involvements, more calculus per se than the patient that doesn't smoke. And as I say, pack years related to the disease states, we tend to wander off pack years now. We just ask the patient, how many do you smoke a day? How long for? It's a bit easier, isn't it, really? And these are the things that happen in smoking. I shan't list these. Um, they're there. Um, it's, the lecture's being recorded. Um, and so, yeah, so very real pathological change within the periodontal environment, making the patient at that local environment more susceptible to disease. And uh, other metabolic risk factors, yeah, we talked about diabetes. Other things such as pregnancy, not a disease, but obviously um, pregnancy with um, altered hormones, altered um, water domain within, within the connective tissue, et cetera, makes the patient more susceptible. Osteoporosis, a lot of work on osteoporosis, not really much significant um, relationship between perio and, and osteoporosis, but people still work on it. Crohn's and sarcoid, which we, I won't really go into. Type one and type two are at risk in times of diabetics if control is poor. And that tends to be independent of plant control or calculus. But we're also realizing that the relationship between diabetes and perio is a two-way stretch or two-way street. So that you know, a patient with diabetes may be more susceptible to perio. If you make their perio better, you know, if you control their periodontal disease, it may have some contribution to keeping a diabetic control better and vice versa. Very early days in that research, but quite important. And if you talk to patients anecdotally, as I did last week, and I said, you know, this patient, we're going back to the COVID business. Um, we've had patients, of course, that because our dental hospital was closed for our perio clinics from March through to September. So we have patients that we hadn't seen for sort of six months and they've been left to themselves. And I was absolutely delighted that the vast majority of, of the patients that, that, that um, came back um, were doing really, really well because they'd gone home with their toothbrushes and their TP brushes and they were treating themselves. So the levels of, of, of disease were, were, were really good. I mean, really nicely knocked down. And I talked to a couple of diabetics last week and they both said, one of whom had a particularly poorly controlled diabetes uh, this time last year. And she was telling me how much her diabetic control had improved since she'd had her course of non-surgical therapy and she was working like a dervish with her um, TP brushes. Brilliant. And these are the pathological effects of diabetes, particularly around the neutrophil chemotaxis and phagocytosis. Phago, um, chemotaxis is um, very important because these were the markers that Van Dyke particularly showed back in the 70s and 80s that were indicative of the early onset diseases so that the, the patients with these diseases were very um, they were very susceptible because their neutrophils were deficient and that they didn't respond to the chemical stimulus of the bacteria. Therefore, the initial part of the chronic inflammatory process was impaired, hence the bacteria got a hold. And this changes with collagen met metabolism and synthesis, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the impaired wound healing we know about as well.
and more biochemical markers and things, okay? It's a big problem and it's a growing problem. I mean, 360, sorry, 360 million people with type two diabetes in the world. That's gonna be more now. Over 4 million in the UK, that's a massive proportion of the UK. Up to 600,000 with undiagnosed in the UK around, that's old, um, that's old information. So it's a real problem, a big growing problem and something we need to be aware of. And very often it's something that we as periodontists or dentists, general practitioners, is something we can pick up early because we see the patients much more frequently than they might see their GP. And we might pick up changes in their periodontium. We might see them going a bit downhill. You know, an existingly stable case might go downhill for a variety of reasons, one of which may be diabetes. So we need to be aware of it. And I'm sure we are. OK. And as I was saying to you before, you know, there's no change in how we manage periodontal disease. Simple things always work best, which is just as well, because I'm quite a simple person. And so simple things and meticulous attention to detail. I think that's probably the big key of um, periodontal therapy. It's meticulous attention to detail from our perspective as periodontists and from the patient's perspective as well. And of course, non-surgical periodontal therapy is the gold standard. It's the mainstream. It's what we do for our patients. And on a cost effective, on a cost basis, cost benefit basis, it's, it ranks much higher than the surgical therapy. If you had hundred pounds to spend on periodontal therapy, you'd spend it on scaling and root surface debridement, not on mucogingival surgery, because that would improve the health of the population, decrease tooth loss and that burden that we saw earlier on in the lecture would decrease. And of course, going with the active non-surgical type therapies as supportive periodontal therapy on that needs basis, um, that nice spider's web that, that, that Lang and Tanetti write, have, have on the burn website, you know, to predict your um, recall interval, very useful stuff. But it's important that we do it and that we don't just assume that we've done our non-surgical therapy and send the patient away because that's when they will get, those pockets will get recolonized, the disease will come back and they're back in the cycle of you know, tooth loss, et cetera. So bags of evidence for that. I won't go into that, but what else have we got? Well, we've become quite adept at using, and I was talking to, um, to remember yesterday, we're talking about biomaterials that we may or may not use in, in, in treatment. We've become quite adept at using our regenerative procedures, uh, enamel matrix proteins, derivatives, membranes, bone grafts. I'm not going to talk about mucogingival procedures today. Um, however, I'm happy to uh, answer questions if you have any. Um, but I'm just going to talk about some of our more modern techniques in terms of regeneration. I'm not going to talk about host modulating therapy. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. The host modulating therapy is low dose doxycycline. 50 milligrams twice a day for any time between three to nine months. Now, the um, protocol behind that is that the um, low dose doxycycline is given at a sub antimicrobial dose and the host modulating is the metallomatrix protease inhibitor um, effect, i.e. the anti-collagenase effect so that the, um, the doxycycline is a collating agent that binds the MMP um, the, the, the enzyme that breaks down collagen, it binds it and inactivates it. So it prevents collagen breakdown. And the idea being that if you give low dose um, uh, doxycycline, it, it helps in the maintenance phase of patients. It was more effective in smokers than non-smokers. And it's not something that I've used very often. I say very often, I've probably, most of the things that, I mean, I, I, I did my master's and finished in 1988. So I've been a periodontist for quite a while. And I think I've tried just about everything known to man um, that's come out because like most dentists, I love having a go at things, you know, and trying, you know, we're all problem solvers and it's nice to try things. And I've tried it. I, you know, we've moved quite a way away from it, although there are still some parts of the world where it's being used. Okay. And the evidence is not great, but there was some work actually at the Royal London um, where they looked at using, um, a statin. It was a middle-aged man's pill they were working on. I don't ever ever know what happened to it, but it was they were using a statin and low-dose doxycycline in a daily pill for gentlemen of a certain age to see if it would decrease their blood pressure, cholesterol, and um, keep their periodontal disease stable. I never know what happened. Anyway, as I said before, one of the things that we have learned a lot more in the last five years or so is to be much more um, selective and targeted in our approach, so that we 
um, very happy to repeat our non-surgical therapy. If things are going in the right direction, very happy to. We have to appreciate that there are some defects in patients that we can't manage non-surgically. There are some defects such as very you know, nice, narrow infrabony defects that yes, we do have to access. We do have to try and think about cleaning them out by direct vision rather than the indirect nature of non-surgical therapy. We're also very, very aware of the importance of aesthetics. When I was a young periodontist, you know, we were doing sort of quadrants of flap surgery, apically positioned flaps. And patients would come in with, you know, pretty boggy gums and they go home with five or six millimeters of recession around those teeth because we'd chopped a lot of that gum away with our apically repositioned flaps. And, you know, um, so the patients went home with lots and lots and lots of recession. They didn't like it. And the other thing we're very, very aware of is the papilla. And unless you're very lucky and um, can reconstruct and place your contact area the right distance from the bone, a la Dennis Tarnow, um, once we've chopped the papilla, it's gone pretty much. But I think one of the most important things we've learned in the past, certainly me, in the past five or six years, is the importance of the clot. That's the clot that forms post-surgically or post-non-surgically, where we have to, um, where we are aware that if we keep that clot stable and immobile and we cover it with good primary closure, then the clot has all the nice things inside it that have the potential to regenerate the periodontal um, apparatus. And that's bone, ligament, and cementum. Because in the past, we've raised our flaps and we've tried very hard to get primary closure, but accepted in some cases mm, across some papillae, we haven't quite managed, we've undermined, we haven't quite, we've quite often had a little bit of breakdown because we've overhandled. Now we must make sure that we have, if we are looking to regenerate within an infrabony defect, we really need to remember that clot needs to be kept stable and enclosed. So good primary closure, whether that's with biomaterials or a membrane or even without. And a lot of this work was done um, in Florence by um, Sandro Cortellini, he's published massive mm -hmm. amount of work um, along with um, Maurizio Tonetti um, on minimally invasive surgery and the variety of techniques available. Now, we were very lucky that we um, went to Florence and we did a, a, a long weekend with, with, with these two guys and some fantastic surgery. And the, one of the, the main things I took home from, not just the lovely techniques that they were showing us, but actually that um, in Cortellini's practice, he had patients that had coming for surgery that just had one defect. Their oral hygiene was absolutely immaculate. So the case selection was superb and the patients um, all did really, really well. But it was the way the defects, you know, the focused and the targeted, targeted non-surgical therapy prior to the surgery that made a big point to me. So case selection. And minimally invasive surgery has given us this um, improved wound stability um, whereby we, we were able to keep that clot isolated and helps, as I say, helps enormously in our um, infrabony type defects. We do a lot of these, you know, modified mists where we access, there's our defects there around this tooth. And we might just take the buccal aspect of the flap, reflect it, and then access the defect. And we don't, we've moved away from that bit where, well, if you can't see it, you can't deal with it. So we would be happy. We would before we gave before we um, did our little surgery. We would, when we numbed up, we would bone sound. We would make sure that we probed around the defect, so we have in our head a knowledge of the morphology of the defect, so that we can access it from the buccal or the lingual, but not involving the papilla, and we can access get all the granulation tissue out. How, make sure that that bone margin is hard and firm, and the root surface is debrided, and then either closed or place end again, or bar wasp, bar guide, whatever the situation dictates in terms of the morphology of the defect, and close, allowing that clot to be completely, um, to be completely immobile and isolated. Okay. And here's some examples, infrabony defect, upper six. Oops, sorry, I'll just press the wrong button. There we go, deep pocket, there we go. Just that little buckle flap. Okay, raised, 
cleaned out, nothing in there but clot. A nice suture, that's um, uh, um, a vertical mattress suture, probably with the loop on the palatal that we can adjust both sides with. And then we come back and the defect is getting smaller. Here's another one, seven millimeter probing around the lower six. Again, very small defect, sorry, very, very localized infrabony defect. A very small flap. Look, there's the papilla. We've not touched it. We've just taken this buckle aspect. We've put BioWAS in this defect and then we've closed up with another suture. This is a vertical internal modified mattress, um, which uh, it's, it's once you learn to, they're quite I find them quite complicated, um, but it, actually it's a nice way of making sure the flaps uh, are, are equally tense on both sides. So that nice primary closure, the clot is nice and isolated. There we are a week later, and there we are two weeks post-operatively. Sutures again, tension-free, primary closure, protect the clot. <laughs> And haven't we protected a few clots over the years? And I think we all agree with that. Those of us who have been that have taught for a while. <laughs> um, so there we go. Here's another case. This is essential, an area that's always very um, aesthetically demanding, particularly in terms of periodontal regeneration. You don't want to lose that papilla. You've already lost some of it because of disease. So what we've done, we've taken that flap. We've just taken the buckle aspects. We've not touched the papilla from the palatal. We've just accessed it all from the buckle. We've cleaned out. We've placed um, BioWAS. Uh, in there, nice primary closer over the defect. Baseline, nine months, add a bit of composite there. Not terrific, the composite, but look, that was the defect. This, we always like to say is bone, it's not, is it? It's, it's kind of radio opaque stuff, but actually clinically, there's no probing there. So clinically that has been a success. Histologically, well, you'd like the, the privilege of being able to go back in there and take a sample of that and look at it under a microscope. But because the clinical result is good, no, we don't. Um, but there you go. Here's another one. This is a, a, a very strange defect that ran a bit around that tooth. We did the same sort of thing here. We took a buckle flap. I can't show you the flap, but we just took this papilla here to simplify papilla preservation. So we just took that, peeled it back, what I used there, I used beta tricalcium phosphate um, uh, vital, which is um, in a calcium sulfate matrix. It's a, it's um, uh, synthetic as opposed to bovine. Most of the materials we use in re regen and bone grafting, things like BioWAS is bovine, BioGuide, the membranes, porcine, Endogain, the enamel matrix der derived protein is porcine. So we do have some patients that won't um, have uh, porcine materials. And certainly, um, particularly when I was in the East End of London, I became very experienced at using beta tricalcium phosphate as a, synth as a synthetic agent because a lot of my patients preferred it. Um, the literature isn't as strong for that as, say, BioWAS, because BioWAS is the, you know, the market, the market is the industry standard really. Um, but the, um, but, but BTCP, the synthetic is not, hasn't got as much literature behind it. And most of its studies have been done in vitro. However, in, it's like everything, you know, if you, you get adept at using certain techniques, it works, you know, better for you, as they say. And I got quite experienced at using it, um, thanks to a very good colleague of mine, Nick Pandy, who sadly passed away last year. Um, he and I used a lot of BTCP, both in our practices and both in the hospital, um, and touched with some very good results. And that's what we got there. So you can see there's some degree of something filling it there, isn't there, with very, very, very little probing after the, after the event. Obviously, a lot of recession. The patient was a bit bothered about the recession. Um, that's, um, as I say, that's what I. Um, oops, sorry. I, I, um, I like to play music, and I like to play. I play bass guitar. And Leo Fender invented the um, precision bass guitar in 1957, and I've still got one that's like that. Um, it's a modern version, but it still works as well. So, you know, as I said earlier on, lots of the old ideas are, um, you know, very, very good. And that's my update on um, Perio a little bit. Um, if anybody's got questions now thus far, I'm very happy to answer. Uh, I don't know how we, uh, how we managed that. Um, oh, there we are. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the new classification in a minute, but just give me a chance to get my breath. Uh, 
Uh, Kevin, uh, shall I put through the questions which have come in at the moment? Please. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. All right. Um, uh, we've got, and then if, uh, if, I, if I can't answer them, what I'll do is I'll say that my internet connection is going. All right. <laughs> All right. That's a good one. So the first question is, uh, what is the impact of vaping? Right. Not good. Very little. And I think that's been one of the things that, that COVID has um, done for us. It stopped a lot of research. We, we, we did a little paper on it about two years ago with one of my students. Um, there isn't that much evidence, but the effects of vaping are the same as smoking. They're, they're harmful, but it, it's in that way of jumping out of the fourth story of a building rather than the 10th story. Yeah. But yes, there are, vaping still has harmful effects, yes. So it's not something that we as periodontists would recommend. You know, we tell patients to go, you know, to give up smoking, um, but we wouldn't suggest they go vaping. Okay. And the second question is, how effective the plasma-rich fibrin, PRF, in regenerative therapy? Right. That is something that um, I don't know whether you used it when you were at the Royal London's room, Ivan. Um, we uh, don't no, use it. I didn't, no, I didn't have a chance no. to use it. No, we don't. It's not that widespread use in the UK. So I have to say I've never used them. Having said earlier on, I've tried most things. This is one of the things I haven't tried because we don't use it in the UK very much. However, there are lots of very good papers and nice pieces of work that have showed its effectiveness. And I would suggest it's a possible thing that, that were we back to normal, I'll be investigating. So this is widely used in US, is it? Yes, it is, but not in UK. Okay. And the third question is, uh, what is the glycemic control level uh, that should be achieved prior to surgical management of a diabetic patient? Oh, good grief. Oh, that's a, that's a really difficult one. Okay. I have to say, um, at this stage, I don't, I don't know because um, usually we don't test, we don't test patients in the surgery, okay. and we rely on their recent tests from their GP. So they're always going to be slightly out of date. So hmm. we tend to use the stability from the GP, and I can't remember the number actually. I'm sorry, it's gone completely. So you mean to say, I mean, uh, when the patient comes into the clinic of yours, uh, you don't do the testing then and there for the glycemic level? No, we don't. We don't, we don't have that facility in Manchester, and I don't know other hospitals do particularly. All oh, right, okay. 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 That's right. And uh, there's a last question at the moment for this session is, what's your view on the use of uh, probiotics in the treatment of uh, periodontal diseases? Okay, yeah. Um, there was a lot of work done, ooh, I think going back sort of 20, 30 years, wasn't there? Things like, uh, yeah, coenzyme Q and things like that, that were, had some benefit. And it's kind of, re, it's kind of re, re, regrown, hasn't it? That there, are, there is more interest in probiotics. Um, my personal view is that really it's down to mechanical plant control and things like probiotics, whilst they may have a beneficial effect, don't have an increased effect over the use of a toothbrush and a TP brush. Okay, and uh, we have just one more question. I'll just squeeze in. Uh, what is the dose of doxycycline in host modulation therapy? Is it 20, uh, 20 milligrams or 50 milligrams? 20. All right. And uh, you'd like hold, on, no, hold on, hold on, hold uh, on. No, start again. Yeah, it's 20 twice a day. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And would you like to go for go for three months or nine months? Well, the evidence in the literature is nine. Most of the studies in the literature have done nine months, but I think that's quite a long time to, med to medicate a patient. Yeah. So when I've used it, I've only given it for three months. And even then I think, you know, that's a long time to be giving a patient a drug. Yeah, along with the, the other questions that the patient might come up with. You know, yeah, I mean, I'm not a great lover of, 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 of low dose doxycycline, to be honest. It's not something I've used very much because I don't really, I haven't okay. really seen the need for it in, in, in a sort of, I suppose, on a population basis. And individual patients, yes, but I'm not really 
that often seen the, the need for it in my own practice, shall I say. All right. Uh, so that's the, the number of questions which I can um, forward at the moment, but there are some other questions which have come up. So I'll, I'll uh, forward it at the end of the next session. Okay. I'm just going to talk briefly, and it will be very briefly because we're going a while about the new classification, um, which I don't know. You can talk, you can tell me before you go, go, Sir Sirimavan, are you using this classification in your practice? Uh, yeah. Good. Then it's not a new classification anymore, is it? Yeah, it's an old, you know, it, 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 it's an old classification because this paper, um, excuse me, I'll just take a. You do realise it's after Sunday lunch in the UK. And normally, <laughs> yeah. I normally have a nap after my Sunday lunch. <laughs> Sorry, so I, have to, I have to say, DYD is the only person I would I would give up my Sunday afternoon nap for. Though, so there we are. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah, you, so Kevin. Not, that's my pleasure, sir. Um, it's not a new classification anymore, is it? 2017, the work was done. My, the, 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 the sort of word I get, particularly from people that were on the working group at Ian Chapel, that it, quite a lot of it was driven by the Americans and their need to stage and grade things. So that um, you have a diet, I mean, yeah, so it class, you know, peri implant diseases, periodontal diseases and conditions. We're really interested in periodontitis. That's what we're interested in. Other conditions affecting the periodontism, yes, systemic diseases, abscesses, etc., gingival diseases. But the main thing is perio, periodontal disease. That's what we're interested in. And it means now that we have periodontitis or peri implant diseases, but we'll concentrate on periodontitis. And that's our diagnosis. That's our diagnosis. Um, we have periodontitis and then we classify it. This is not a diagnostic. Um, tool. It's a classification tool which aids us communicating to each other about patients, helps us look at the progression of the patient's disease, their cumulative effect, and hopefully where they're going and the complexity of the case. Not a diagnosis. What it assumes, as I said, this is our diagnosis. And you have to have a definition of periodontitis, which we've all got one, inflammatory processes involving the deep periodontal tissues. According to the 2017, it's a, you know, interproximal clinical attachment loss of greater than two millimeters or greater than three millimeters at two more than two um, non-adjacent teeth commonly used. So attachment loss of some degree. That is our diagnosis, periodontitis. And of course, we've gone through a variety of different classifications. I mean, as I said, I trained and finished my master's in 1988, so I was very, very keen on the 1989 classification. It made a lot of sense to me. And it made a huge amount of sense because at that time, my research, I looked at neutrophil function as part of my master's and, and, and later. And I was very, very interested in, in, certainly in Van Dyke's work and others, that looked at neutrophil function in relation to the early onset diseases, particularly localised juvenile periodontitis in the younger patients molar incisor pattern. There's a huge amount of evidence that neutrophil chemotaxis was impaired in these patients. And I loved that, it was really interesting. And I thought, yeah, that, so he went even further and said that, you know, neutrophil function or dysfunction, if you like, was diagnostic of these early onset diseases. And that made a lot of sense to me. Then of course, evidence, you know, refuted that, or there was contra contradictory evidence. So the early onset diseases were kind of bunged into a big classification called aggressive. We lost the refractory disease and we had chronic and aggressive. I still like the 1989 classification, as I say. And now we have periodontitis as our, di as our diagnosis. And we hark back to the um, graph I showed earlier on with, with, with Lur's um, uh, T worker studies. Um, it implies that we're all somewhere on this spectrum of periodontitis. So we have periodontitis and we have, there we are. And this is the um, more detailed um, definition. But we have staged our disease and we grade our disease. And it's as simple as that. How we do it is based on what we find in our clinical examination. And in the case of the BSP version, our radiographic examination, initial, moderate, Severe with potential for additional tooth loss or severe with potential for total loss of the dentition. And we also describe 
the extent and distribution. Is it localized, generalized? Same old rule of 30% as before, you know, more than 30% generalized, less than 30% localized. Molar incisor as a description in those cases that used to be localized juvenile prodontitis, as we called them in the past, yeah. And then we've got our grades, which is the evidence of progression or the risk of progression, along with anticipated um, treatment response, which is difficult. They talk about this being a bit more predicting of progression than the previous um, classifications. I'm not sure that it is because we're still based on history. And we talk about slow rate, moderate rate or rapid rate. Can I ask you, Sir uh, Ivan, again? Sorry to, to 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 keep putting you on the spot. Do you no, use the a, do you use the um, American version or the British version of the um British, of, of this British version? Version. Oh, good British. man, good man, excellent. <laughs> yes, That's fine. That's okay. It's a slightly it's slightly easier and it's slightly um I think slightly more practitioner friendly. Yeah, straightforward. That's right. Yeah. yeah, because you're using root length and how much bone you lost on radiographs. It seems to be easier to me. So the, yeah, so the, 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 the thought is that, you know, by staging and grading, it gives you some idea of how that patient's going to progress. And that's based on history. And that's one of the things that's always been a sort of a, a dilemma in, in, in periodontal um, or in perio is that patients, we can only tell that patients have had periodontitis because they've got attachment loss. We can't say they're having it because we don't know that they've got an active infection. We can only look over our shoulder and say they've had it. They've got a pocket if that makes sense. So there we go. And so, yeah, the idea was that it individualizes the diagnosis and case definition, takes into account the variety of things that go into that patient's makeup that makes them have their disease at that level. So that's how we get our staging and staging and then thinking about how susceptible they are by that staging and then their grading. Again, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of on the fence about as to whether I think it does what it says. But I certainly think it's a move forward from the last classification, the 1999 Armitage. Um, yeah, so there we go. Why stage? Move beyond the one-dimensional approach and we can look at um, future things in terms of complexity of treatment. And considering all the relevant dimensions that are in the, you know, the, are in the, the where that patient is at the moment, all the things that contribute to it. We also need to classify the severity and extent and the complexity. And this is something um, that we will, you can see here um, in terms of the complexity, um, severe disease. Oh, I've just moved the, sorry, I've just moved things around on my screen. It's gone funny. Okay, yeah. Severity in terms of tooth loss, in, in terms of complex re rehabilitation, secondary reclusive trauma, reach defect, bike collapse, etc. All these things add to the um, severity number of grading in, 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 in the um, classification. Okay. Oh, hello. Press the wrong button. There we go. And if we look at, oh, let me just move. Sorry, my, uh, that's better. Right. And then notes on staging. This is the key as well for me for post-treatment patients. If a stage shifting complexity factor is eliminated by the treatment, the stage should not regress to a lower stage. So you come into the program um, uh, 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 as a stage, a stage four, you're going to end up as a stage four because you will always have that risk, if that makes any sense. And similarly, um, grading based on history, analysis of the progression and in terms of the BSP, which I'll leap onto in a moment, we look at amount of bone loss on the radiograph in terms of the patient's age at the worst affected site. And that will give us some idea of how that patient may respond going forward. Again, it only looks at where they are. And we say, you know, you're a high risk of progression because you've had a lot of disease. But actually, if you look at any long term studies of periodontal disease, particularly the Hirschfeld Wasserman type study, the patients that had you know, the worst outcomes of patients and the biggest predictor of future periodontal disease is past periodontal disease. Now, in terms of the grading of um, in the AAP um, EFP version, they're looking at, um, <coughs> excuse me, amount of attachment loss over a period of time, particularly with the grade modifiers of smoking and diabetes. But in the BSP, we also know 
Um, so we also need to know about the extent and the, and the um, severity, also the risk factors that are present, but the, peri the, the BSP is a lot more simple because it looks at um, the basis of bone loss rather than clinical attachment loss or clinical attachment level, which is not something that we look at normally in practice, if that makes any sense. And, you know, complexity index. Yep, the same with grading. We tend to use the grading was to look at um, radiographs, percentage of bone loss divided by the patient's age. So anything over one was C, anything between half and one B and under the half A on the worst affected tooth. And we also need to look at current status um, and stability. So we look at, this is the guideline from the BSP, something that's currently stable with less than 10% bleeding, pockets all four millimeters or less and no bleeding at those sites, etc. Stable, remission and unstable. So the majority of our patients come in, they'll be unstable. And also risk factors. So um, smoking, including cigarettes, a day and suboptimally controlled diabetes. You may also think, well, actually, is suboptimally controlled diabetes? Yes, it is a risk factor, but is a patient who's diabetic at risk anyway, even however well controlled they are? You might argue yes. So that's how we do it in the, in the BSP. And if you've got these nice laminated sheets, it really helps you as it gives you all the information you need there on the staging and the grading using periapicals, OPG. You can use bite wings, but you know, they're not, doesn't show you the whole root length, but it might, you might have bite wings anyway. If the patient hasn't got that much you know, level of disease, et cetera. Um, and this is uh, the BSP example, which you'll see on, on, on their website. 49 year old patient, no diabetes, several courses of periodontal treatment, lots and lots of recession, clinical attachment loss. So there she goes, good health, no medication, no diabetes, never smoker, lots and lots of pockets. We've got a detailed pocket chart. There's her, um, there's her clinical photos. Then the detailed periodontal chart shows, oops, sorry, deep pockets of greater than five millimeters on seven teeth, up to nine millimeters, moderate on, I can't see mine, moderate on 11 teeth, and fication involvement for all upper molars and upper first molars. So there's a patient with a lot of disease. So, the classification, there's the radiographs. This patient's 49, more than 50% bone loss around that tooth, that tooth, that tooth. So that gives, her, gives, us, a, gives us a clue to her, um, her grading. Bone loss on all teeth except these teeth, up to 80% bone loss. Yep, over one. 21 out of 26 teeth are bone loss due to periodontitis. So that makes it generalized for C, currently unstable. And I think that's pretty much all I want to say. So thank you all very much for your attention. And I see there's some more um, questions popped up there. So I'll, um, I'll take those as long as they're not too difficult. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Kevin, uh, for an excellent lecture. Well, like you mentioned, the questions are rolling in. Oh dear, uh, oh dear. <laughs> I think you will be in here for quite a bit of time. Um, well, the first question is, uh, uh, can ultrasonics be used instead of braces uh, curates for root planing? I'm sorry, I, I, what was the question, sorry? Uh, can ultrasonics be used instead of braces curates for root oh, planing? Yes. Absolutely, yes. Did we move away from you using the term root planing, really, because we don't plane the roots as such like we used to because uh, that kind of implies removing cementum really um it's, it's all semantics it means nothing you know it, but i never i don't like the word planing sounds like i'm doing something in my shed um oh. scaling never sounds very dignified so i like debridement um so, yeah uh, the thing with the, the graces the graces are a lovely instrument but you've got to have them sharp okay and you've got to sharpen them but ultrasonic yeah the, the, there's often been um often been um research on you know what's better clinically no difference the ultrasonic may leave the root surface smoother than the gracie but you know again clinically no difference so no and i use both in the normal course of events now at the moment since i'm doing all my debridement on a non-agp clinic i'm doing everything by hand so i'm right. using great 
yeah would you say i mean uh, in this age because of covid and everything uh, yeah. uh, it's advisable to go for the hand deep brighten uh, then if you it it depends i mean I, if you're geared for agp working and you've got all the right ppe um and you want to do the whole mouth then mm -hmm. go ahead with the ultrasonic i'm just thinking it we need to sort of just think a little bit about what we're doing and how we're doing it um, so if you've got a session, if you're all geared up for AGPs, go bang ahead with your um, ultrasonic. Okay. And uh, the second question is, uh, what is your recommendation regarding use of chlorhexidine mouthwash in periodontal disease management? Um, as an adjunct to therapy, um, we always use it post-surgically. We always use it in patients that can't, haven't quite got the manual dexterity to manage as an adjunct. Um, yes, very effective. It is the only um, antiseptic mouthwash we've got that has efficacy. So, you know, it's, it's a very useful adjunct, but I don't use it as a treatment long term. It's usually for short term management. There uh, are exceptions. Can you elaborate on uh, about the duration well, I would usually I use it post surgically in patients that can't post surgically wouldn't be able to manage a toothbrush around the area of surgery. So that would probably be up to three weeks. Okay, so you don't recommend uh, uh, using it prior to surgery. You mean immediately prior to surgery? Uh, about one week before the surgery. Not as a rule, because I would expect my patients to have really really good oral hygiene before I thought about doing surgery on them. Okay. Right. And uh, the, the, another question is, uh, uh, this is regarding the staging. Uh, is this similar to the staging used in malignant lesions? Yeah, it is. And that's one of the sort of, um, was one of the um, drivers from the Americans, apparently, in, in, in staging. So that you have, yeah. So yes, that's one of the, was one of the drivers. Interesting. Um, do you recommend uh, surgical pro procedures for anti-infective therapy? I'm not quite sure what 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 that means. Sorry, anti-infective therapy. I don't quite understand. Uh, I think uh, the question is regarding like uh, when you do flap surgeries as such, uh, yeah. uh, which incorporates with the anti-infective therapy. I think that's what the the question is directed to us. So you're doing your, you're sort of doing your flap surgery to effectively turn on the healing and removing inflamed tissue. Exactly. Yeah. So you should be able to manage in 90%, at least no more than that with the non, with good non-surgical therapy. So the answer is no, I suppose. All right. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, Another question is, how likely is it for the immunosuppressants induce gingival hyperplasia to occur in very young children, especially children who are five years or younger? How likely is it? Yeah, that's right. That's an interesting question. I don't know, actually, because I treat very few children. I would say it is likely, but of course, once they lose their primary dentition, then that gingival hyperplasia will go with it because it's plaque related. Yeah. But obviously, um, if they've got it and it's impeding things, then it, you know, the only treatment we have for it is surgical removal. When you are using surgical removal, this is a, a, an adjunct question, which I'm going to put. Uh, do you use laser or do you go for the uh, scalpel? I tend to use scalpel. Um, again, um, little experience on lasers in a hospital because our, our hospital won't buy one for me. So um, I would use a laser if I had one um, because they're very effective in this particular instance. So, I'm, so I gather from the, from the literature. But at the moment, I'm stuck with a blade. So yes, a blade. And then you need to think about what kind of flap you're going to... Are you going to do a conventional gingivectomy? Mm -hmm. where you, you know, do your 45 degree incision or are you going to do an inverse bevel gingivectomy and thin the tissue which is much better for the patient yeah Comfort. Uh, there's another question which has come up is regenerative therapy contraindicated in teeth with an ongoing secondary occlusal trauma 
Right, that's a good question. Um, one would try, and um, one 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 would try um, to relieve any occlusal trauma prior to surgery. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a tooth that is mobile and you're doing in uh, and you're doing regenerative surgery around it, I would always splint it. In terms of um, in terms of certainly the short term post surgery, so that you've got that clot held firm and that tooth isn't mobile. So I would splint. I think about intermediate splinting for about three months. If I could. So it will be a periodontal splint for three months. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a bit of wire and composite. Not yeah. It's not very. <laughs> it's not very elaborate, unfortunately. But yeah. All right. So is it a, a plain wire or a twisted wire? Well, I, if I use, I usually use plain wire with just a loop on. You know, I usually make, I usually fashion it myself from a bit of orthodontic wire and then make a loop on each end. If all I've right. got twisted wire, all, all, all the better because it's much more attentive. But you know. All right, got it. And uh, uh, this is from one of your colleagues over there in UK. He's asking whether the new classification increased the need for radiography. Especially in keeping with the mind the Alara principle. Uh, who asked that question? Was that George? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a very, very good question, actually. Um in my in 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 in, in um, certainly in my own practice, my own clinic, I would say no. But then we have a radiology department that are always telling us we're taking too many radiographs. So we tend to make a lot more use of our OPGs. And so okay. most of our patients on our diagnostic clinics would come and have an OPG or have an OPG sent from their own dentist. So for me personally, it hasn't. But I can see the danger mm -hmm. that, that, is, you know, that, that there is a possibility that you might increase. You know, that I can see why, because you want to see, you know, you want to take periapicals. And of course, a good long cone periapical is the radiograph of choice for um, looking at periodontal bone levels and the, and the apex. So, you know, yeah. But then our radiology colleagues throw their hands up and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, what is your opinion uh, regarding the two mouthwashes, Listerine uh, versus Clohexidine? Again, the evidence is much stronger for Clohexidine as um, an adjunct to therapy because it's a much more effective anti anti antibacterial antibiotic, antiseptic. So we tend not to use Listerine. Now, having said that, I use Listerine every morning, but there's no evidence in my mind that is doing me any good, but I use it every morning because I like the taste. <laughs> and uh, 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 in which occasions would you recommend to use the membranes in surgical management of periodontitis? Mm. Okay, that's a difficult. That's a whole different lecture, really, mm. on regeneration. Um, mm. I would be looking at larger, wider defects. Um, than the ones I showed you in the little presentation, um, where I'll be the narrower, the longer, narrower defects are much more amenable to things like endogate. Right. Uh, in whereas a wider defect, if I needed support for the soft tissue, then I'll put a membrane in there. If I and certainly if I was using BioWAS as well, I would very likely use a membrane with BioWAS. You have invited yourself for another webinar. Oh, thank you. <laughs> In the in the photos that you showed me um, uh, regarding the use of bio os, uh, before you place the bio os, do you treat the root with endogame? Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. That's a really that's a really um, bad answer, isn't it? Um, if I was going to, if it was a narrow defect, I'd be relying on the end again to give me my, you know, my potential for regeneration. If the defect was wider, I might put BioWAS and I might mix the BioWAS with end again. Yeah, because it's what, when we I... UK, it's what we say in UK belt and braces, you know, hold your trousers up with both of the braces and a belt. You know. <laughs> when I was in Royal London, we used to do that for every route before we placed yeah, the BioWAS. We, yeah, we. We tend not to do it for every route. All right, okay. 
and uh, can uh, CL replace the need for the radiograph? No. I saw who answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> and another one is, uh, can you please comment on the laser use on the road? Yeah, I, 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 I personally can't because I don't have experience of it. However, um, I do have colleagues that use it. Um, and uh, and the evidence and their own experiences are very, very positive. Hence, I would have one if I could buy one. So uh, did you have a chance to uh, uh, sort of encounter with this photodynamic ther uh, therapy as well? Yeah, I haven't much. I haven't. Again, I've got no experience of that or the evidence for it. All right. And I think you'll find a number of periodontists in the UK are the same, you know, yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, at what stage uh, would you condemn a tooth for the extraction? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a <laughs> very difficult question because it's, you know, how long is this piece of string, you know? Um, is the tooth restorable, you know? Is it a useful tooth? You know, we get quite high bound at trying to save teeth that are a unsavable and b actually not much use. You know, a solitary standing molar that's unopposed. You know, in a mouth that's got five to five. You know, things like that. Um, so it's every single situation is different. So when would I condemn a tooth? If the patient asked me to as well, if it was interfering with function, if it was painful, all those things. If the disease wasn't helping, yeah. Okay. I know I'm taxing you. I'm sorry about that, but the, the oh, it's fine. No, it's good. I can, I can, I, I just pretend my internet connection is going if it's getting too much. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the, how the treatment changes with the new classification of periodontal disease. Oh, oh, oh. Um, I, I don't think, I, I don't think treatment has changed. No, I don't think, I, I and it shouldn't do. Because if patients, you know, patients have a level of disease, they, sh you know, yeah. they should get the treatment that they, you know, that that level of disease um, dictates. I don't think it's changed uh, the amount of treatment or the sorts of treatment we're doing. I suppose by that you would say, well, is using the new classification picking up more disease? That would then increase the, 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 the that would then increase the amount of treatment, wouldn't it? Um, so I guess yes. I, I don't think so. Well, that's a very broad statement. I've got no evidence that it does, um, because certainly in UK, <coughs> and I guess in Sri Lanka, you're still using the PPE for your basic yeah. examination. Of yeah, the right. And it's only when you start scoring those threes and fours that you go around the rest of the mouth. Of course. And so we're still relying on the PPE for, you know, 90, well, yeah, 90% of our patients that don't have periodontitis. So um, that's what I would say. I don't think so. There we are, let's look. <laughs> that was the clever, clever British professor, so I don't know, wasn't it really? <laughs> what is the opinion regarding selective grinding uh, of teeth uh, when you are treating occlusal trauma? Right, yeah. It's one of those things, that's, yeah, again, it's a bit like saying which teeth do you take out. I mean, selective grinding. If you've got an occlusal problem, then you should be managing an occlusal problem. If you've got periodontally involved teeth, um, that have some degree of occlusal prematurity or whatever, you start grinding them, they usually come back into that position at some stage unless you do something yeah. else. So it's a, it's a, you know, short term, like I said before, about the, you know, with the secondary occlusal trauma, I would splint. I would adjust if necessary and splint. Well, that's not to, um, that won't cure them things. It, it, what it will do is just give you time for that clot to form and hopefully tighten the tooth up. All right. Okay. What I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll, I'll call a timeout, not a timeout. I'll, I'll uh, you know, uh, stop the, the questions. Fine. The phew, phew. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, I, I really like to uh, see you uh, during our APDC uh, in uh, May. Uh, yep. I got uh, the, the, the information that you have a, a nice uh, lecture lined up as well. So uh, hopefully we can uh, forward and interact some more regarding periodontology at that time. So let me take the time to thank you.
from the bottom of my heart as well as on behalf of the Sri Lanka Dental Association and the Commonwealth Dental Association for providing with a very in-depth and excellent lecture along with uh, the natural uh, the humor that you are associated with <laughs> which made things light for everybody and uh, as you can see from the number of questions that were rolling in everybody was you know integrated uh, with the the lecture and i think uh, in future that our postgraduates from this end will be having more opportunity to interact with you um, that's the great thing about working from home now, isn't it? You see, you can interact <laughs> with anybody in the world. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for your time. Um, uh, I'm sorry troubling you on this uh, Sunday evening. And, blame uh, blame DYD. Don't, don't, that's fine. He can take all the blame. All right. I usually uh, do. <laughs> usually do say, so. yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I'll see you around. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. That was great. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Hello, everybody. Letter, uh, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. So we have thank come you. to the end of our um, webinar. Thank you, everybody, for joining.